I hope uh, to convince you that uh, we have some data which uh, follows uh, the line which we just saw, that we see uh, increase of conductive heat flow with depth, and uh, we think that this is a significant paleoclimate signal from northern Europe uh, in perfect agreement with what we just uh, saw here. In for this audience, I hardly uh, need to tell something about the importance of having uh, high quality heat flow data. Heat flow is the principal boundary constraint for modeling and interpreting thermal structure of the deep subsurface, understanding structure and dynamics of the lithosphere and the underlying lay upper mantle. And in terms of applications, uh, we apply heat flow as the boundary constraint for modeling. Uh, temperatures of geothermal reservoirs and estimating thermal resources, and this is uh, exactly the purpose of our studies. Uh, and um, yeah, again, uh, of course, uh, uh, in particular, heat flow method, in particular at shallow depths, as we have seen, may be perturbed by a number of factors. Uh, listed here, you know, all will know these factors. I will emphasize the, uh, the, the first part, the climatic uh, temperature variations. Uh, and in this particular talk here, you may consider this as noise, but as we have just seen, this may be also the signal. This may be the, the signal to understand the, uh, the past uh, climate. So corrections may be applied, but uh, great uncertainty may be introduced if observations are not from, uh, from great uh, depth. So, and this is the study area of uh, Northwestern Europe, uh, where we have in the Danish area, my primary area of study is the, uh, the North Sea basins, uh, and also we have some results from the Baltic Shield and the Caledonites, Scandinavian Caledonites. Uh, in, in addition to heat flow studies, I did uh, quite much uh, recently with students and uh, postdocs on seismology and gravity. Uh, but today I'll focus entirely on our, our, our thermal, thermal results. Uh, uh, we, we have some uh, important results uh, which I will present for you in terms of uh, high quality observations from deep boreholes in the Danish basins. We have uh, several boreholes uh, reaching the depth of two to three kilometers and from the Baltic Shield I was uh, so, uh, so happy and lucky uh, to be able to measure the, uh, the deep borehole in the Cillian Ring. Uh, down to a depth of uh, five kilometers. It was drilled down to more than uh, seven kilometers, uh, but it was not available deeper than five kilometers uh, during uh, our, our campaigns. At my department of geoscience uh, at Aarhus University, uh, my group uh, developed uh, equipment for measuring uh, uh, high resolution temperature, temperature gradients over the years. Uh, we started with quartz oscillator, uh, os oscillator probes and uh, we moved into the thermistor based probes uh, with the, uh, the high resolution of uh, close to one milli, milli Kelvin. We had uh, our first, uh, uh, our first winds was, sorry, back here, our first uh, winds was this, uh, this uh, trailer based winds with uh, 7,500 meter of one conductor rushes the cable. I heard some rumors that the Swedish would be so, well, uh, would drill into granite <laughs> to find, uh, to find, uh, the, to find um, hydrocarbons. And, uh, and I was uh, giving a hint that if I had a, a, a logging equipment with more than seven kilometers, I might be invited to go there. And so uh, I had some money from the uh, EU uh, geothermal program, so I bought some uh, seven kilometer <laughs> one uh, uh, cables for this, uh, for this uh, probe. And uh, so uh, since I think that was the, the only equipment at that time uh, which could do it, uh, I was invited to, to visit uh, Sweden. Uh, this, uh, this is actually from the, from the Graubeer uh, borehole. Well, I should uh, continue here, yeah, not talking about too much about old times. Uh, uh, the, uh, the first uh, compilation of, of heat flow from the Danish area, onshore and offshore, I did for the European Geothermal Atlas back in 1992. Uh, and at that time we mostly had uh, good quality bottom hole temperatures. And we saw that for this particular area, with this number of observations, we saw the background heat flow basically within the range of 767 uh, up to about 80 uh, milliwatt per square meter. This has recently be, uh, been uh, confirmed, so we have this uh, relatively high and normal, as we have seen, uh, heat flow in, uh, in this uh, basin. Uh, 
Recently, we did a study where we compiled all available shallow uh, thermal information from uh, boreholes in Denmark drilled for uh, different purposes, some of them for heat flow purposes, uh, some of my own uh, boreholes, down to a depth of 300 meters. And in all these boreholes, we observe low heat flow. Low heat flow and also low conductive heat flow because this is uh, very much uh, clay rocks without, without any significant groundwater motion. And we, uh, we, we see uh, basically a heat flow of the order of 30 to 40 milliwatt per square meter, which is about only half of what we saw from the, from the deep uh, boreholes. I'll show you one example. This is from the Ha borehole dwelt to about 300 meter, where we have uh, very detailed observations. This was uh, a borehole of my own, uh, which was uh, dwelt for the purpose of stuttering uh, heat flow, high resolution heat flow at shallow depth. And here we, uh, this is uh, from a, a, a more recent uh, temperature log, uh, tens of years after drilling. We see here the temperature, even negative in the top part. This is uh, the recent warming. I'm not going too much into this. We have uh, thermal conductivities measured with a needle probe conductivity and isotropy measured. I think we have uh, five to ten, uh, ten uh, points uh, per, per meter. So we were able to, to uh, have an interval heat flow uh, down to the about five meter interval values with a fairly stable, stable sequence, uh, giving a mean value of uh, here, 37 milliwatt per square meter, consistent with what we've seen in other boreholes. A different way of interpreting these data is here on a regional uh, coverage, where we make a so-called, uh, what may be referred to as a so-called bullet plot, where for a number of litologies, we plot temperature gradient versus uh, 1 over thermal conductivity, which we call thermal conductivity, and from the slope of this Lee squares regression line, we obtain, I think this is just a coincidence actually, we obtained the seven, 37 uh, milliwatt per square meter again. And there's a very clear correlation between, between here conductivity and temperature grain. This is just Fourier's law actually uh, plotted here in, uh, in that way. So we were very happy about, this is not just from single balls, but this is a regional characteristic for this particular area that we have this low heat flow, say around 30, 30 to 40. Or so. Now we are looking into our best uh, observations from deep boreholes. We have bottom hole temperatures of good quality down to 5,000 meters, but we have also high resolution information from surface down to 3,000 meters in two boreholes, ORS 1 and FASI 1, both for uh, geothermal purposes, but at the depth of 3 kilometers, the sandstone was too tight or are too tight uh, for, for, for production for, for geothermal energy. But uh, back in time, at around uh, 1980, I uh, managed to, pro to convince the company that these two boreholes should be kept open, open for, uh, for uh, temperature locking to see that we could approach the equilibrium conditions and study heat flow in these two boreholes. So uh, they, these boreholes were, were, I locked these boreholes for the last time in 2014, I think, before closing. So we have tens of years after drilling. So I think we have here, uh, or we have here, we have here demonstrated uh, equilibrium conditions. This is from one, the one borehole, ORS-1, where we see in the uppermost part, we have here 1,700 meter of almost homogeneous uh, chalk limestone. So this is really something, uh, something good to have heat flow estimates from. from uh, we do not have this variability as we saw in the previous talk. We have a homogeneous section in the upper part where we could estimate conductivity even we, if we didn't have the core. Variability in temperature gradient in the deeper part is correlates. This is a rough uh, litology, but it correlates perfectly well with clay, clay rocks, sandstones, etc., with the high gradients in the clay rocks and the low gradients in the in the sandy rock. So uh, except for some local spikes here, we, we uh, find that we have a conductive, overall conductive regime. Now I think this is uh, so far my, thing, uh, my most important figure here. From the, because this demonstrates uh, heat flow increase with depth for the, uh, for the northern part, for the Danish basin. We have shallow 
core boreholes with quite a number of observations, similar to what I showed with the hard boreholes, 30 to 40, even some uh, lower. These are uh, 50 meter interval heat flow values of the crosses of the uh, low heat flow. Down here we have some interval cores, 10 to 15 meter interval cores, but we have high, we have high resolution temperature gradients uh, correlated we, where we uh, measured also gamma logs. So we know where we are in the, in, in the, in the borehole. We know that we have the conductivity, we have the gradient. So we have classical heat flow de determination on course here giving about 70, 75 milliwatt per square meter. And in between these shallow borehole, these shallow uh, observations here and the deeper observations, we have the estimated conductivity from logs and we have the, the, the accurate temperature gradients, and I think these, uh, these are from two boreholes. I think these are 100 meter interval uh, heat flow, combining the, the near surface values with the deeper values, giving this curve here. And if you may, you may remember from the previous talk, and this curve shows exactly the same trend as this perturbed gradient, which uh, Jan Sefander showed. Okay, we moved into doing some uh, modeling. We had the observations, and now we have the modeling here. A model, this is a forward model, this is not an inverse model. We have uh, modeling in terms of the perturbation of heat flow with depth for the uh, ore spore hole, where we have this deep chalk section. So I think we have reasonable estimates of conductivity and diffusivity. And we uh, did a model with uh, latent heat and without latent heat, uh, where we considered the last glacial maximum and uh, uh, cold temperatures back in time. If we look more closely on this, and these are the temperature increase from last glacial maximum up to the uh, post-glacial times in Denmark. The temperature increased uh, up to about 8, 8 degrees uh, below 10. So uh, here we have three models. All will show always use the low heat flow at around uh, 30, 30 to 40. Uh, perhaps this is slightly too low, but this is also minus 8 to plus 8 degrees. Minus 6 to plus 8 with permafrost shows about equivalent results as minus 8 to plus 8 degrees with no permafrost. So permafrost matters, but it doesn't change several degrees still. This is, uh, this is not the last uh, model we are doing. We are preparing some inverse modeling similar to what, uh, what we saw. But it's clear here that this, this covers the observation in terms of the main, of the main trend. Permafrost uh, reaches down to below zero, reaches down to about close to 200 meters in this particular model. So we see a significant increase of heat flow with depth in observations, and I think this is, uh, this is the, a model which uh, approximates our, our observations. Now I'm uh, moving to, uh, to the Baltic Shield, to the Sildian uh, ring area in Sweden, where we have uh, high resolution continuous temperature locks uh, down to 5,000 meters that part of the Gaubert borehole available for our, our logging. Uh, we started here and we had our uh, last uh, log uh, 2018. This is the temperature, temperature gradient. We see some variability here in the, in the central part, which is likely, and this is, this is stable over the years, this is likely due to uh, local uh, groundwater migration, but this is stable and we have no reasons to believe that this is not a basically a conductive uh, regime. Yes, five minutes, okay. We have here the observation, the observed heat flow versus depth, which is around 45 to 50 milliwatt per square meter, almost constant. But if we consider the heat production, which is pretty high here from uh, spectral gamma log, we can calculate the steady state the steady state curve here and the difference between the observations here and the steady state, we interpret this as the uh, paleoclimatic signal. So the uh, observations are around 45 to 50 milliwatt per square meter, but the steady state is 65 milliwatt per square meter, making a difference about 15, fi at least 15 milliwatt per square meter due to uh, what we interpret as uh, paleoclimate. I finish very quickly now with some few uh, slides about the application and implications. Uh, here we have a compilation of heat flow in this northwestern Europe where we cle clearly see this increase from low heat flow in the north. This is paleoclimatically corrected, but then perhaps on the low side as we see it now, 
but we see an increase of heat flow uh, from northeast to into the basin as about with a factor of about two to three. And this is also what we see here in Irina Timjeva's uh, compilation of lithospheric thickness. There's a clear correlation between lithospheric thickness, thick lithosphere in areas of low heat flow, and uh, this is the uh, less thick uh, lithosphere in areas of the higher and normal heat flow in the, in the basins. Recently, together with Sven Fuchs and a colleague from, the, from GEOS at the in, uh, Geological Survey in Copenhagen, we did heat flow, and heat flow studies and thermal modeling for the Danish area with the purpose of having a, uh, a good uh, quality 3D subsurface uh, uh, model. And thanks to uh, uh, the cooperation, excellent cooperation with Sven Fuchs, and you have heard excellent uh, modeling, even with inverse uh, modeling constrained by conductivities, we are able to have a very good 3D model for the Danish area where the uh, model temperatures fit perfectly well to the observed temperatures. Uh, so we have a validation, which uh, I think this is uh, uh, definitely it's the best model we have uh, so far uh, for the Rhenis area. And uh, according to one of our reviews and according to Sven's uh, excellence uh, modeling results, this is among the best uh, models that uh, for, a certain, for a certain area which we have seen uh, so far. Temperatures at a depth of 2 and 3,000 meters are shown here. There are significant differences due to thermal conductivity difference, due to heat flow background heat flow differences. We are able to model temperatures for geothermal reservoirs. We have geothermal sandstone reservoirs covering most of the Danish area, and I see a great potential for hydrothermal systems for the future. We have three so far, but within the next five to ten years, I think we will see a significant in increase. And now we have good models. We can predict temperatures for the geothermal reservoirs. Now I'm coming to uh, summary and conclusions. I'm sorry if I'm taking a bit too much uh, time. So, in terms of our observations and models, we definitely observe a significant increase of conductive heat flow with depth up to a factor of two in the Danish basin. And I'm, I was happy to see what we saw now here also from, uh, from Jan Sefandes. This is uh, almost the same, almost the same increase and almost the same amplitude in our, our models. This means that shallow intermediate depth heat flow in northern Europe is significantly affected by long-term paleoclimatic surface temperature variations, last glacial maxi maximum significantly below zero. Our observations are in the rim between what was ice covered and what was not ice covered. So, um, yeah. Uh, general shallow heat flow data should not be applied uncorrected for deep thermal modeling, in particular for this area. And uh, sometimes it may even be difficult to correct because there may be light, uh, great uncertainties on the correction re results. Emphasize the importance of high quality heat flow data. In particular, we need some uh, deep boreholes, which are of critical importance as uh, reference data. Thank you very much for your attention.